Welcome, everyone, to the uh, first session of ICCP 2018. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Koppel. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida, and I'm really happy to be here with you all. Um, many of you know that Pittsburgh sits at a confluence of rivers, and I like to think of ICCP as a confluence of different fields and ideas, vision and graphics and optics and things like this. And all the three talks that we have in this first session have this sort of characteristic. Now, because this is the first talk, I just want to remind you all and the presenters that each talk is 20 minutes, three to four minutes for questions. And I'll signal you guys so that you know about this. And uh, let's start the first talk. We have two accepted papers and one invited talk. The first accepted paper is titled Towards Photography Through Realistic Fog. And it's by uh, Guy Sadat, Matthew Tansik, and Ramesh Raskar at MIT. And uh, if Guy can come up and start uh, talking, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for. Can you hear me? Is it yes. working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers for what I'm sure will be a wonderful uh, conference. Um, as uh, mentioned, this is joint work with Matt Tansik and Ramesh Rostar, my advisor. Um, and our goal is basically to see through extremely dense fog. And this is a pretty scary video of the car driving in such conditions. And the long term vision is basically to see the road a bit off, as if it were like this. Um, so we're not quite there yet, but let me first show you what we can do now. Um, so this is our mannequin, and between the mannequin and the camera, I'm going to introduce some fog. And this will be a video as fog being added to uh, the scene. And on the left is a regular camera, and on the right is what we're able to do, recovering reflectance and depth. And in the bottom, I'm writing what is the estimated visibility in these conditions. So very early on, we see this back reflectance from the fog that kind of like corrupts the measurement from a regular camera, and we're able to remove the fog from the measurement and see the scene as if the fog are not there. And one of the important things that I want to mention is that as you know, computer vision algorithms are not as good as our eyes and our brains. And in this case, I have some letters and numbers, and I'm just going to pass it through some off-the-shelf OCR. Um, and what you'll see is that the OCR fails as soon as the contrast degrades a little bit. And the recovery using our system is much more robust. And that is expected because we know that most computer vision algorithms are designed for images that were taken in almost perfect conditions. And that's exactly why computational photography, computational imaging is important. And so there are many different industries that would benefit from the ability to see through extreme dense, uh, extreme dense fog conditions, and this is just a part of this. And so our recognitions are, um, we provide a system, we provide a system that is a time domain to see through extreme dense fog conditions, and we provide both the depth and reflectance. We have an experiment with a wide range of fog conditions. Uh, that is dense, dynamic, and heterogeneous. And the visibilities that we support is up to 30 centimeters, which means that if you hold your hand like this, you don't see your fog. And we estimate the fog parameters without any prior knowledge. And so the key idea is this observation that uh, photons that back reflect from the fog and photons that back reflect from the target obey different statistics. And we use this observation and develop a, statistic, uh, sorry, a probabilistic technique that rejects the back reflected photons. And so you know that the field of imaging through scattering media has been extremely active in our community and other communities, and this is just a partial list of related works, and also this clustering is potentially not perfect. Uh, but maybe I'll focus on one work that I think is closest to what we do, uh, and this is this work by uh, Srinivasa from ICCB in 2005, where they use structured light to reject black reflectance from milky water. And basically their observation was that if you look at uh, spatial coordinates, you see that Pixels that are actually uh, just back reflected light from the milky water and those that are uh, of actual targets look different. And they use this observation to reject the back reflectance from the milky water. And we have something similar. We're doing something very similar in the time domain. And our ability to do it in time domain allows us to see through extreme dense scattering. And so this is the fog that I'm dealing with. This is my fog, tiny fog machine. Um, and you can see that my fog is, is realistic, it's dense, it's dynamic, it's heterogeneous, and things constantly move around, and there are these patches of uh, dense fog and not as dense fog, and so on. And this is the actual experiment that I have. This is the fog chamber, and I have a sped camera, and I'll explain exactly how it works. 
and we have this diffuse pulse failure that's flood illuminating the entire scene. And we have a regular camera along with uh, a CW flashlight. And the idea is that uh, we compare to this regular camera and that the two systems, the regular camera and the SPAD camera, enjoy this as much as possible the same conditions. So they both enjoy directional light source, both don't have any ambient light or backlight and so on. And we have a parameter and I'll explain exactly why. And our fog generator is all the way at the back. Uh, we have multiple of these uh, tiny fog machines along with a fan that basically blows everything around. And because this is not milk and water, I cannot just give you the recipe for this is what you have to mix to replicate my experiment. Instead, I use optical thickness as a measure to how much scattering I have. This is the only reason I have a power meter in the back. It's just to reproduce the experiment. I don't need this for anything else. Uh, and optical thickness is a unitless parameter that basically measures how much fog there is. Um, and to give you a sense of what it means, I place this... Uh, um, different posts at different distances inside my fog chamber, and I'm gonna start pump fog in, and you'll see that we get to visibilities that are below 30 centimeters. And by the way, filling that chamber with fog takes about 15 or 20 minutes, so I'm fast forwarding everything. And, and we have a, a SPAD pixel, and SPAD is Siegel Photon Avalanche Diode, and to explain how it works, we send basically a pulse of light to the scene, and our detector time tags an individual photon event. And so we get a number. And we can place this number in a histogram, and then we send another pulse to the scene, we get uh, another number, and we repeat this process multiple times. Until eventually we can just build a histogram. And so our detector is actually a camera of these pixels, and we have 32 by 32, and each pixel is giving us this list of numbers with corresponding individual histograms. And so now we start to develop a model. And the model is basically a pixel-wise model. And so per pixel, I'm sending a pulse of light to the scene. And let's track a single photon. And that photon is going to scatter a bunch of times until it's detected by our detector. And the detector is just going to tell us when the photon was detected, the time. And the time is simply the, di the sum of distances between scattering events divided by the speed of light, or just the sum, between time, the sum of times between scattering events. Um, so the single uh, number encodes this extremely complicated process, and the real thing that I care about is whether the target was there or not, and I don't know that just from this single number. So again, this single number is all I have, and from that I'm trying to estimate what's going on. Um, and, and what we basically have is uh, three classes of photons. We have background photons, those are photons that back affected from the fog and never reached the target. Signal photons are photons that reached the target and came back and measured. And dark counts are just our noise, and fortunately, it's very low, so we neglect it. And so this is kind of like LIDAR, right? A single pixel from our camera is just a simple LIDAR. So if you look at the, at the scene without any scattering or fog, you're gonna have a peak in time, and that will tell you where the target is. But this is what we measure, this is an actual measurement. You can see that the fog completely corrupts this. Um, and now we can play a game, and you should ask yourself where the target is in time. And if you take a, minute, a moment to guess, and later on, I'll show you where the, where the target actually is. So our goal is basically to extract the peak that corresponds to the actual target. So let's start by modeling the fog. And the time is just the sum, between scat time, uh, the sum of time between scattering events. And we know that these times are distributed exponentially from scattering period. And then I open a probability book and find that the sum of exponentials is just a gamma distribution. And so now we know that given that the photon that we measure is a background photon, this is this given peak it obeys the time, the time distribution is just this gap. Okay, so let me show you that this is reasonable. These are actual measurements. OT is optical thickness, going from left to right is more far. Um, and the red curve is our gamma fit. And you can see that we're doing a decent job in fitting to the measurement, especially as you go to the right when there is more far, we're doing an even better job. So what about, what about our signal? You probably think that this would be another gamma or a convolution of two gammas. It turns out that the better model is just a Gaussian. Uh, so given that we have a photon that is reflected from the target, it's a signal photon, this is this given S, then it's just a Gaussian. And the reason for this to be a Gaussian, one, one uh, intuition is just when your uh, number of between scattering, the number of scattering events is very large, the gamma distribution looks like a Gaussian. So our full model is just the law of full probability. The probability to measure a photon at a given time is just the sum, the probability to measure a background photon multiplied by the gamma, plus the probability to measure a signal photon multiplied by the normal distribution. And all I care about is the, is the part in the right which encodes the target depth and reflectance. 
So in practice, what we're trying to do is to decouple our measurement into a background term and a signal term. So this is our model, and at this point, I don't know anything, right? I just have a model, and now I'm going to explain exactly how we estimate these individual pieces. So my pixel is giving me just this list of, list of numbers, um, and so I'm not using actually a histogram, I'm using KDE. KDE is kernel density estimator, which works much better than a histogram when you have a few sampling points. So now we know the left-hand side of the equation. Now to estimate the right-hand side, we start with the gamma distribution, and here I basically assume initially that the signal is neglig negligible, or actually noise, and we use exactly the same list of numbers to fit the gamma distribution, um, and just maximum likelihood, no, nothing fancy here. Then we subtract these two things, the KD estimate and the gamma, um, to get the signal term, which is this yellow curve. And finally, we just fit the Gaussian distribution to the yellow curve, and we're basically almost done. The last piece is to estimate these two prior probabilities. And to estimate them, which it turns out you just have to solve this linear system. And now we have the entire model. So now if you try to recall what was your guess previously, I'll show you the result. Uh, so you can see on the right, our kind of like this bright green curve is our model fit to this histogram. And you can see that this tiny fit here on two and a half nanoseconds is where the target is. So if that's what you guessed, you were right. And if not, that's not that bad because this algorithm can do it for you. Um, and so the model is doing this a job in fitting to the measurement, which is exactly what we want. But this is just one example. So here are multiple examples. Um, these are different levels of fog. Going from top to bottom is more fog. The top is no fog at all. And from left to right, our targets at different distances. So left is close target, and right is a further away target. And you can see that the model is doing a decent job in fitting to all these different conditions. And of course, it fails at some point. It fails as you go to the bottom and to the right. These are cases where the fog is very dense and the target is far away. And that sort of makes sense because when there is a lot of fog and the target is far away, your probability of measuring photons from the target is very low. So basically we have no signal to work with. So to summarize the process, we start with from our measurement, we estimate the background, we subtract the two to get the signal, and from the signal we extract the reflectance and the depth. And I skipped many uh, details, but this is the high level idea. So now let me show you some results. So again, these are going to be videos starting from no fog, and then I'm going to add fog, and you'll see how the fog enters the chamber. Top left is OT is optical thickness. On the right column is our reconstruction, showing reflectance and depth. And on the left are comparisons. So the, uh, the far left is regular camera, and I should mention that the regular camera, the flashlight was actually near IR, so that's a longer wavelength than what we use for this pad. So there is physically less scattering there, so it's actually easier. Um, and the middle column is uh, the, um, some comparison using our SPAD camera. At the top is photon counting, basically an equivalent of a regular camera using the SPAD. Um, and the bottom is time gating, where I manually chose the time being to the first time point in which there is something there. Um, and I'm going to start to play this. And of course, I'm comparing using SSIM and PSNR. And very soon you see the fog. You can clearly see where the light is coming from in the photon counting in regular camera. This is the back reflectance from the fog that you always see when you drive at night with fog. You can see that our reconstruction is doing a decent job in rejecting this. You can also see that the time gating is extremely noisy, which is also predictable. And of course, my system is going to fail. For the further targets, when they're far away and there's a lot of fog, I'm going to lose these further away targets. And I explained earlier why. And so this is SSIM and PSNR over optical thickness. And you can see, especially in the SSIM, that our result in the blue curve is doing much better than the other methods for a wide range of fog conditions. And in case you wonder about the, uh, our accuracy in recovering depth, these are the different targets at different distances, um, se separated by distance. And uh, you can see that we're doing a very good job in estimating the depth as long as uh, when, there is, um, when the target is close, closer and less fog, which makes sense. But even when we start to make some mistakes, the mistakes are bounded to be usually within one centimeter for targets that are between 35 to 50 five centimeters away. And this is another result with our infamous mannequin. And again, you'll clearly see, uh, <coughs> sorry, you'll see the back reflectance from the fog, you'll see the time gating is extremely noisy. And it's, it's predictable that time gating will be very noisy because you're measuring a lot of, even if your time gate is very narrow, you're still measuring a lot of back reflected photons within your time gate. You have to do something about them. And in a way, this is exactly what we do. We reject those these photons. So there is a long way to go. Uh, this is the, these are the limitations, and I'll discuss basically what does it take to scale something like this to a uh, real world, or, or what basically what does it take to put something like this in a car. 
So the first thing is that we ignore the special nature of scattering. My model was pixel-wise. That means that I ignore the fact that when photons are uh, basically reflecting the target, uh, they scatter on the way back to the camera. And I assume that they end up in the same pixel that they should have. And that's a big assumption, which is not that accurate. Um, there are two ways to overcome this. The first is to impose some priors, to basically smooth out the scene and make things a little bit uh, uh, more uh, uh, nicer. And actually, in the results that I just showed you, I'm glad you do that. Um, basically, just regularizing everything. The second thing is, is, is even more important, is to account for this scattering that the photos go on the way back to the camera. And that is the next big project that I'm working on. The second thing is photon efficiency. So our system is extremely inefficient. Our efficiency now is one to a million. That means that we send a million, a million pulses to the scene and we measure just one photo, which is not that great. Uh, and, and we also think that we can do better with our algorithm. Right now we use roughly a few, just a few hundreds of photons per pixel, um, but we believe that we can do much better than that in the future. So that directly relates to our acquisition time. Uh, so the way that the spec channel works is that right now every 100 microseconds we get a new number, a new photo that's detected from our camera. But that's just one number, so I need some history. Um, and so I, I need to keep track of what happened before. And that's a window that I look into the past. And in my case, it's a fixed window of 20,000 frames, which is equivalent to a window of two seconds. So I'm limited in my ability to handle moving targets. Um, but what is nice about uh, this, this method is that um, I can basically do some dynamic windows. So I estimate the fog, I know what the level of fog is, so I know basically how many photons I need to track targets at different distances, so I can adaptively choose what that window should be, and I can even do it on a per, per pixel level. And this is a simple engineering thing that you can do to reduce the acquisition time substantially. The last thing is scale. So how does this scale from my benchtop experiment into large scale scenes? So optical thickness is unitless, which is nice. So imagine that I have some concentration of fog in my chamber, and that means that there is some fixed number of water droplets, and now I'm going to expand my chamber to a very large scene. The number of droplets is the same, so the number of scattering events is roughly the same. The only thing that changes is the time between scattering events, which is actually larger. So more or less, I should encounter roughly the same scattering, so that means that it should roughly work. Um, in fact, I gained something because the time between scattering events is larger. That means that I can relax my need for a good time resolution in my detector. But I'm going to suffer more from the special nature of scattering. Photons that scatter on the way back to the camera, are this, this scattering is going to be much more pronounced, which means that I have to solve the, the first thing that I mentioned in this slide. So to summarize, we support a wide range of fog conditions. The fog is dense, dynamic, and heterogeneous, and we go from no fog to extremely dense fog. And it's calibration-free, meaning that I don't have to know anything a priori about the fog itself. I'm actually estimating everything from the measurement. And by the way, I can also estimate optical thickness from my measurement. I, I haven't shown it here, but it's very easy to do. We recover both the reflectance and the depth. We support this dynamic acquisition time process that I mentioned in the last slide. We don't have to raster scare anything. We flood illuminate the scene, and that's it. And our technique is a probabilistic computational imaging method. And it sort of makes sense, because this problem is stochastic in nature. And so a solution that is probabilistic in nature is, I think, a good fit for this problem. So thank you, and I'll take some questions. Thank you, Guy, for that uh, great talk and amazing results. Um, thank you. Uh, does anyone uh, have any questions? So while people are uh, getting brave to ask questions, um, I have a couple. So you, you mentioned all these previous works in scattering, uh, and many of them, in addition to obtaining the depth, they also obtain some kind of properties about the fog, like scattering or, or particulate size, or even uh, you know the velocity of the of the field, because mm -hmm. uh, you have a fan. Uh, do you extract some properties of the uh, scattering media? Uh, here, or can you? So basically we estimate the parameters of the gamma distribution, and, and so the, these parameters encode um, this information. So for example, we, uh, we know to estimate the optical thickness from, from the parameters of the gamma distribution. That's very easy. There's actually a linear relationship between the um, new parameter of the gamma distribution and optical thickness. Um, so this, this one is already there. Uh, I'm not, I don't think we can do the movement of the fog. I think this is probably more challenging, again, because we 
in a way, we throw everything at this probabilistic framework. So when everything is in probability, it's it, like you abstract away a lot of these properties, uh, which is a feature or a bug. Depends how you want to look at this. Um, any questions? Well, I think we have a few here. So. Right. Uh, so our sensor is 32 by 32 pixels, and the time resolution of each pixel is 56 picoseconds. Um, and for color, that's actually a very good point. So um, we haven't done color, but the laser that we use is a super continuum source that is wavelength filtered to arrive 550 nanometers. Um, and the sensor is monochromatic. So because we have just 32 by 32 pixels, I'm not going to put a barrier mask on my sensor. That would be too much. But what I would like to do is to just, instead of just block to 550 nanometers, do one experiment with 550, then move the wavelength filter to, to blue and move the wavelength filter to red and can basically capture RGB sequentially. Or if the, um, someone would produce a sensor with higher resolution, then we'll just place some Bayer mask on the sensor and then we just use the super continuum source as is and just capture uh, visible part, uh, visible scene as is. And that's actually a good point because one of the applications of this is to read road signs. Um, so how can you read the road sign? You have to have this uh, diversity in color measurement to do something like this. Oh, to merge the regular camera and the SPAD? Right. How do you read the sign that's 32 by 32? So um, Lincoln Labs have a sensor that is megapixel. They have had the sensor for, I think, 12 or 15 years now. So sensors are out there. It's just a matter of, of putting your hands on them. We use a commercial sensor. Um, but, but it's all CMOS-based. So it's just a matter of scale, right? So if a lot of... If you put something like this on every car, this is kind of like LiDAR, right? LiDAR five, 10 years ago was $50,000, $70,000. Today, people talk about hundreds of dollars. So it's just a matter of scale. And, and again, it's the ability to put this on CMOS, which is um, a clear path to, to scaling something. All right, well, I, I, I think we might have to leave that uh, for offline. Uh, just before we thank Guy again, I just want to mention, I forgot to mention in the beginning that he's going to be uh, on the job market next spring. And so if you're interested in some of this stuff, please talk to him. Um, thank you so much, Guy. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll go to the uh, next accepted paper, which is focal sweep imaging with multifocal diffractive op optics. And uh, this is being presented by uh, Ivan Peng. And it, the paper is by Ivan Peng, Xiang Don, Quilin Sun, Felix Hyde, and Wolfgang Heidrich. And this time I won't forget, uh, Iman is also graduating. He's actively searching for positions in academia and industry. So please talk to him if you, if you like this talk. And please go ahead, Iman. Oh, is it this one? Um, just, just a little bit. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, morning, guys. Um, my name is Evan from UBC. So this work is cooperative between UBC, Kaos, and Stanford. So we are here because we believe that like, uh, we can incorporate both optics and computation to enable new computation imaging modalities. And this usually involves a mix of optics, sensing, computation, as well as human visual system, although their form factor can be very diverse. But there is one point, the optics volume does matter. We say like conventional systems are always like bulky, expensive, and heavy because we want to have higher image quality. That means we want to we have to somehow have like increasing optical complexity. But we all expect to have a capture device with high image quality as well as compact form factor. So this expectation contributes to the popularity of cell phone cameras. Like extra 0.1 millimeter signal can be a saving point. To this point, so since the critical bottleneck is the optics, the volume of optics. So industry has like carried out a few solutions like using dual cameras on your cell phone, or like this example, a true stem phone zoom lens, using, multiple, uh, using a multiple reflection to bend the light path to assemble a bunch of optical elements with zooming function in the cell phone. But again, optics volume does matter. And we need large amount of optics volume to compare with both chromatic, monochromatic aberrations and chromatic aberration. 
So both are reflected as a one-tier blur across the full image. So here we show the category DPSF of two simple reflected lenses. So as you can see, they both exhibit a special and spectral variant PSF distribution. So the ideal scenery in optics is to map all these points as small as possible, like just delta functions. But this is very challenging if we want to decrease the volume of optics. And we are here because we believe that computational imaging technique can add as a virtual component to shift the burden from optics to computation. So what matters is not the direct measurement on the sensor, but the process result for human visualization. So that's what we have been doing. And to this end, we aim for extending depth of field. Depth dependent defocus results in a limited depth of field in most consumer level cameras, particularly for those embedded cameras where a large numerical aperture, which is a small F number, is expected to ensure the high light throughput in most cases. For sure, like limited depth of field can be very interesting in photography, like setting the portrait mode for most of your cell phone cameras. But there are definitely many scenarios where an all-in-focus image is expected. So that's the motivation for our work. And state of the art of this work ranges from capturing the entire light view to engineering the shapes of point spread functions by wavelength coding. Uh, these are all very famous work. So using the prior knowledge on the mapping relation between the kernel shapes and scene depths, we can recover all in focus images. An alternative approach that I presented in previous ICCP is to leverage spectral focal dispersion along the depths, because we know that different focal, different wavelengths will be focused at different depths. So that the result image quality relies on the reflectance of the scene and the illumination spectrum. Also, the depth of field that can be recovered uh, from the chromatic aberration of regular reflective lenses is limited. Another advance in this community is to apply sweep type solutions, such as like spatial focus sweep or spatial focus depth. So focus sweep and focus depth strategies differ in that a focus sweep camera captures a single image while its focus is quickly swept in the depth range over the exposure. And the focus depth camera captures a series of images at different settings. The later one is more complicated in terms of capturing and processing data so as to facilitate like refocusing performance. So to this work, we focus on the focus width. And the concept behind focus width is quite straightforward. So we firstly rely on special, in special integration to firstly obtain depth invariant blur kernel during the exposure. Then we apply the image deconvolution to remove this residual aberration. Sweeping reduces the calibration requirements of depth variant PSFs in the capture. As you can see, the goal is to have relatively depth invariant PSFs. But one common fact that has not been addressed by state of the sweep type cameras is that most of the current systems relied on sweeping complex reflective optics, then the optics volume issue still remains. So regarding this for optics volume, we encourage to reflect the perspective from ray optics to wave optics. In particular, deflective optical elements, or we call DOEs, have drag wave attention because of the addressing and lightweight physical structure, flexible design space, and availability of material fabrication methods. So for now, you can directly treat them as the flat lenses with microstructures on the surface. Unfortunately, the wavelength dependency of deflection leads to strong chromatic aberrations. So putting all pieces together, unlike conventional lenses with single focal lens, we aim to encode multiple po focal powers onto one single element. So despite much research in optics of multifocal lenses for like contact lenses or clinical applications, existing consumer level cameras barely use this kind of multifocal design. So theoretically, by enabling multifocal powers subject to depth, it is viable to shorten the sweep distance 
as well as to achieve better conditioned integration of the large depth range. So theoretically, uh, like the math is very simple, as you can see, so we have three curves, and the three color curves visualize the relations of the focal planes and object depths. So like here, for instance, we have the three focal, uh, then focal powers, like focused at 49.5, 50, and 50.5 millimeter, respectively. S1, S2 here represent the sweep distance needed for the three focal lengths and the single focal lens. So as you can see, we can almost reduce half of the sweep distance. So here shows the PSF comparison of the monochromatic design subject to thin depths. So it ranges from 1.5 meter to like 8.5 meter. So as you can observe with the same sweeping distance, PSFs of our design, the bottom row, has to be less special variance than a regular reflective lens with a single focal power. So this more depth invariant block kernel makes it possible to deconvolve the full image with only one single calibrated PSF. And now there is a trade-off like about the data bank ways that we have to obey. So particularly for DOEs with two pi modulation, it's very challenging to obtain good focusing contribution for multiple depths and multiple colors. Also the fabrication feature size for the limits the design freedom. So to this end, we have considered two lenses. The one is designed with single color pattern fusion, the left one, while the other one is designed with RGB color pattern fusion. So the graph fusion of the lens profile is quite straightforward. So first we divide the aperture into like, for instance, three rings of equal area. Then the monochromatic design is actually a radio mixture of sub-regions screened from the Fresnel lenses and the wavelengths of 550 nanometer for three different focal lengths, which we call three focal lengths. And similarly, the RGB color design is the actually asymmetric mi mixture of three monochromatic designs subject to three spectrum. So that means now we have like nine uh, focal powers, three focal lengths times three spectrum, which we call nova focal lengths. So this, the reason to encode this actually asymmetric design relies on that. The resulting PSF will encode the partial high frequency distributions, as you can see on the right. Rather than a Gaussian distribution spot, this would benefit the post-processing to preserve both color fidelity and the details of high frequency components. We will go into the detailed comparisons later. So with respect to the implementation, we fabricated the diffractive lenses using photolinsographic techniques. It's a similar microstructure fabrication technique that has been widely applied in IC industry for making electronic chips like CPU. So we approximated the diffractive lenses with 2D, 2D microstructures of 16 levels. And here we show the microscope images of the two lenses we fabricated and the actual color PSFs. So we next move to the other part of the computation imaging deconvolution. So during image processing, we solve an inverse problem with a data fitting term as well as a regularization term, which is to penalize the natural image priors. This is like very common. And specifically, we revisit the cross-channel prior because we say one of the problems about DOEs is about the chromatic aberration. So we try to enforce the similar gradient distributions between channels, RGB channels. So we say that intuitively, the edges in a natural image always exist at the same locations for different spectrum. So at the reference channel, the problem is formulated as this, a regular data fitting term plus a TV prior. At cross channels, we introduce an additional cross-channel prior, which is to enforce the gradient sharing between channels, as mentioned. So all of this now tends to a highly nonlinear optimization. Alternative trees can be played, like we use select variables and formulate the proxima operators. The details are, pre is, are presented in the paper. 
So I'm going to show the results. So using the color PSFs derived from the two real prototype lenses, we have some synthetic data tested on a number of test images. So with respect to the three focal lens, we enforce the cross-channel sharing only from the green channel image to the other two relatively broad channel images, the red one and the blue one. So with respect to the normal focal lens, we enforce the cross-channel sharing among all three channels. So, okay, so that's the deconvolved result without using cross-channel. That means we deconvolve the three channel images individually. So as you may observe, the color artifacts, and which is more severe for the single for the monochromatic design because it can only be focused at one specific wavelength, the green one. And then that's the deconvolved result with introducing the cross-channel priors for both lenses. So as you can see, the color fidelity much higher. So the table shows the PSNR averaged over 100 test uh, data set images. So we see that in both scenarios, I think a cross-channel prior indeed have resolved better image quality. And further, the RGB color encoding, the, the actually asymmetry encoding, contributes to a higher color fidelity. Although the sharpness may drop a little bit when zoom in for details. So this is mainly limited by the data bandwidth that we just mentioned. And these are some experimental results. So first, the result of a single color multifocal sweep imaging. The images are sharp while the color fidelity is low because we only focus on one specific reference. And that's the result of images for the green channel only. So if we look only into green channels, the green channel, sorry, it's with very good image quality for the large depth range. So from the 1.4 meter to the 3.5 meter. And the results of RGB color multifocal group imaging, as mentioned because of the trade-off between color and spatial sharpness. So uh, the, the spatial resolution drops a little bit, but the color fidelity is much higher than the single color design. And we also compare the depth of field between our three focal lens, the left one and the standard Canon EF 50 millimeter reflective lens on the right. So both with the F number 6.2, the scene depth range from 1.5 to 3.5 meter. And as you can see, highlighted by this color regions and all of suffering from some image contrast loss because of a fabrication error, ours can extend the depth of view with a sharp sweep distance. For this setting, the sweep distance is only 0.5 millimeter. And we can do more. Because now that using photoneosgraphic techniques has the advantages of large design freedom because of this large amount of small pixels. But the 16 levels physical structure drastically limits the modulation range. Because like previously using photoneosgraphic, we are doing a two pi modulation for the lens like this. And we use the 16 level micro microstructures to approximate a continuous surface which is not enough. And what if we can use higher order deflection? So it basically means that wiping height is much larger. And in this design, so we have the 100 to pi. And the total thickness is only 115 micrometer. So it's still very trivial. And we can still treat it as flat lens. And we use the diamond tuning, high precision diamond tuning method to fabricate the lens. As you can see from the zooming figure, it has a lot of rings, structures on top of the surface, and it's still very thin. And now we have a thin and flat lens with an F number only 2.2. So these are some experimental results. First, the result of a single color multifocal script imaging with the diamond tuning lens. The blurry input Deconvolve with results without cross-channel prior and with cross-channel prior. And let's zoom in a little bit so you can see the tell the difference. So the images are sharp with color fidelity is low. Another example, same, the blurry 
we saw cross chain applier with cross chain applier. And now that the F number is now is only 2.2. We also compare again the depth of field between the three focal lens and the standard reflective lens, both with the F number of 2.2. The same depth, the same from 1.5 to 3.5. So ours did have to extend the depth of field with a short swim distance. So what's remaining is about image artifacts from the experimental results, as you can see. Regarding the haze, the deflection efficiency loss is still noticeable, especially for the photonusographic 16-level uh, designs. And with respect to computation, we have not yet fully explored more advanced priors or deeper or dehazing tricks to help get better image quality, which is the future work. And also the chromatic aberrations because of the uh, there are still some like spectral deviation and also the PSF calibration error. So one last thing I would like to address is that current lens profiles are designed by heuristic pattern fusion, which is independent to the post-processing. And insight in the future is to investigate a more intelligent design scheme that applies learning strategies to guide the design. To conclude my talk, so we try to extend the concept of focus grip from reflective optics to diffractive optics, where we fuse multiple focal powers onto one single element with the scene and light form factor. In contrast to state of art swift designs, ours can generate better condition point spread functions along accepted depth range with drastically shortened swift distance. And that's the end. I would like to thank all these four institutes for providing support in this project. UBC, Cal Stanford, and Georgia University. And that's the end. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> and you can scan the QR code and refer to our project webpage for details. Thank you, Evan, for the impressive talk. Uh, do we have any questions for Evan here? Oh, there's one over here. Go ahead, Steve. How did your result compare with the higher number than Sorry. simple, simple <coughs> number than and then maybe Yeah, that's a good question because, like, usually if you want to uh, have a large depth of field, you can use like a very large f number. Say, we also compare the lens with f number f12 in this case to resolve the same depth range, and that means the yeah, as you see the as you mentioned, the no, the image could be very noisy, and we try to use the additional denoiser to recover from that input, and I wouldn't say it's better than our results. Yeah. It's quite noisy. And we did compare to that. And in this case, the, we want to make sure that the small F number can contribute to our low light illumination capture scenery. And also if we want to have like future designs for trying to go like capture the video or whatever, you need to have the shorten uh, swift distance and uh, sh short exposure time. That's my understanding. So I have a, a question while we're waiting. Um, so I saw your fabrication slide. I had a question about how you might extend these methods to long wave IR, so 8 to 15 microns yep. you know, for gallium arsenide uh, sensors. Have you thought a little bit about it? Because the fabrication process might be a little different. I think the fabrication process for the photoinstrographic can be extended for uh, other wavelengths. It's just like the design of the patterns. Because right now we use the 550 for visible, uh, for visible spectrum. For IR, the central wavelengths would be different, like around 800, something like that. You can still use the similar photo uh, photographic technique, just a different recipe. Yeah, and, but using like the freeform lenses, like the diamond tuning machine, then you have to consider the absorption of the lens substrate. Yes, for your alternative technique, um, uh, those uh, those uh, materials absorb 
a lot yeah. of long wavelengths. Yes, so that's the problem that you also need to consider the material absorption. Yeah. But currently, we focus on the visible spectrum for the RGB color channel, RGB images. So we actually have time for one more question if, if there's any questions up here. Yes, go ahead. How is the, the wave from, from the refractive, uh, how similar is it to, to spherical aberration? Oh, yeah. The spherical aberration, I mean, that depends on like two, several factors. One is about the F number. The other is about the field of view. So compared to the regular like reflective lens, the spherical aberration of a deflective lens, say the Fresnel, Fresnel lens, is already much smaller than the regular uh, reflective lens for single wavelengths because it's more like flat lens. That's my understanding because it's a uh, regular uh, reflective lens. Is basically, <coughs> say you have a spherical curvature of the surface. And that means it suffers from like huge spherical aberration for the small f number, but for the diffractive lens, it's a flat lens. It's already webbed, and the face profile is in ideal case, it's already as spherical design. That means the spherical aberration for on axis uh, field of view is already much smaller than the regular diffractive lens. But we have not yet considered too much for uh, off axis case. All right, um, any more questions? All right, well, let's thank Avon and uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so th those were our two accepted papers and now we have uh, an invited talk. We really have a, a great treat for you guys. We have uh, uh, Katie Bowman who, will, who is uh, going to be talking about corner cameras. And she's a postdoc with the Event Horizon Telescope and she received her PhD in 2017 uh, at MIT with Bill Freeman. And it's going to be a, an amazing talk with even a, a, a demo here. So hopefully. we're all, <laughs> hopefully, so we're all looking forward to it. Um, and please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to be talking today about some work that I did with a number of uh, other colleagues at MIT on seeing around corners. And so this work was done, um, a lot of it was done with the help of Vicki Yu, who was a master's student at the time and now will be a PhD student starting in the fall. Adam, um, also a graduate student. Um, Fredo, Greg, Greg Warnell, Antonio, and, and Bill Freeman. So imagine that you wanted to track two objects, maybe one was red and one was blue. And if you're just in their line, direct line of sight, you could just use some sort, you could take a video or stand with a standard camera, take a video at them and use some sort of tracking software to, to figure out where, where they're located. But what happens you know, if you put a wall in, in, in front of you? Well, you no longer really have this direct line of sight, and so you can't use a standard camera to take a picture of the scene because you would just get a picture of the wall. And so this problem of seeing around corners has gotten a lot of attention recently, and um, for good reason, because having this kind of superpower of being able to see around corners could help in a lot of different situations. So for instance, being able to remotely sense occupants um, in a room would be really valuable um, in search and seizure kind of rescue operations. Um, so maybe in the case of a fire or when you have debris falling, you might want to be able to see if someone is in there that you should go in and save before you risk someone's life going in. Um, various um, endoscopy procedures um, where it's very challenging to get into tight spaces. And also in uh, 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 avoidance collision systems, it would be great to know, you know, if a car or a child was about to bolt out from behind a building, um, and those, you know, you could give you, if you knew what was behind the corner, those even a few precious seconds could really be helpful in saving some lives. And so because of this superhero ability would be so valuable, there have been a number of different kind of approaches um, that have been developed to try to come up with ways of seeing around corners. And here I'm just kind of showing just a few of these. And um, there are many different approaches, but a lot of them do work by thinking about how objects behind the corner actually affect the time of light, of light that is kind of bouncing and scattering around. So just to make this more concrete, um, if you were you know, to shine some light, maybe a laser, at the wall, that light would reach the wall and then scatter all over. And some of this light would then um, go um, bounce to objects behind the wall, some of it would return back to you. Um, and the light that returns back to you um, 
you, you could measure the time of arrival, um, how long it takes to do that, and that time that, um, that it takes to get back to you is related um, to you know, the distance between you and the wall and the speed of light. But you'd also get um, some reflections from the other objects. So um, you, you, um, the red object here would um, cause a different little pulse of light to arrive at you at a lo longer time related to the distance of that object to the wall, and same for um, this blue object a little, a little bit longer. So by looking at the distribution of how the light arrival times, uh, looking at that distribution, you can try to constrain the geometry of what's behind the wall. And this is a pretty neat idea, and as I said earlier, many of these systems develop, work somewhat off this idea. But to make this work, they ha um, often have to use some sort of specialized equipment, and they have to, um, you know, actually add some illumination into the scene. So they're active in nature, and, you know, although it's getting much better, they do sometimes re um, require some sort of elaborate setup. But we wondered, you know, is there a way that we could just use a standard consumer camera, even just a camera like an iPhone, instead to see around corners? And if we did this, we, uh, we wouldn't have to use any kind of specialized equipment, and everyone would have this kind of superhero um, ability just in their back pocket. But um, how can we go about doing this? You know, how can we even just use a standard camera? Well, we made the observation that the light that we see actually comes from many different sources, including objects that um, aren't directly visible to us. So as I showed earlier, light from the other objects is scattering into the, into the visible scene as well. And so perhaps we can use naturally occurring structures to tell us about the light that is hidden to us. So for instance, imagine if you were looking at the corner at the base of a wall's edge. Um, although the wall prevents you from seeing the scene to the right of the corner, you may notice that there's this kind of fuzzy shadow on the ground. And these fuzzy shadows appear basically at every corner. Um, I often didn't notice them at first, and after working on this project, you see them everywhere. So maybe you'll, you'll see them now. <laughs> but anyway, this shadow is actually called a penumbra. And the penumbra is caused by light that is coming from that obscured scene. So in this case, you have, there's this bright window behind, which is making that that shadow really apparent. But if there are people moving in that scene, if the scene starts to change, this penumbra actually um, changes slightly. And these changes are really, really small, but they're measurable. And so it turns out that we can actually interpret these subtle um, changes and use them kind of as a camera to see into the scene behind the corner. And so to show how to use the penumbra to recover the hidden scene, I just kind of want to um, look at this kind of simple example. So again, you imagine um, you have these two cylinders, or you can think of them as two people, one red and one blue, and they're hidden behind a wall. And if you were to um, stand with your shoulder up against the wall, so you're not at the corner, and, and you can't see the people behind the wall um, because, the, it, because it's blocking you, right? But if you were to take one little step over, you can see a little bit more of the hidden scene. And you take another step, you see a little bit more, and you keep seeing an increasing amount of that hidden scene until eventually the entire scene comes fully into view. Um, well, similarly, just as you see different parts of the scene when you're standing at different, um, at different angles around that wall's edge, different points on the ground actually reflect an integrated light, the integrated light from different parts of the hidden scene. And we can use that. So formally to explain this, um, basically, if we have some sort of diffuse floor and our camera is looking at a point on the floor, the reflected light at that surface point P, which we can parameterize with its radius and its angle theta, um, that, the light that is being reflected there is a function of the surface's albedo um, and as well as the incoming light that is observable from that point. And that observable light can be split into two components. So the first component, LV here, um, it's very weak, I guess, <laughs> where, how I have it. But um, that first component is light that is from the visible scene. And um, this is the light that every point on that penumbra, it can see that, that light. So it's everything to the, below the line, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the second component is this, um, the light that's from the hidden scene, LH. And this is the light that reaches the point from that hidden scene. But because the wall is blocking part of the view, it's only going to be able to integrate part of that hidden scene's light. And the portion of the hidden scene um, that is integrated depends on the angular position um, of the point. So, uh, so this point over here will integrate a different part of that hidden scene. 
Um, and so the reddish section on the ground here is it happens. Uh, we, we would predict it would happen because it is going to see that red cylinder. And then the purplish part happens because it is integrating light from both the red and the blue cylinder, so it um, makes purple. Um, but what happens if we take the derivative? Well, in this case, this component from the visible light cancels out and the integral cancels out, and we get a term that basically we're left with a term that is a function of the light coming from that hidden scene. And so if we actually take some sort of video of the corner with this type of setup, you can't actually see anything. And the color is um, invisible often to the naked eye. But if you amplify, the difference is relative to the case when there is um, no people in the hidden scene. You actually see that the, these light on the, around the corner actually matches our prediction. And by simply taking the derivative of the light around circles, um, ar around circles around this corner, and combining the information across space to reduce noise, we can actually obtain a single one-dimensional um, image that indicates the light that is coming from different angular positions of the hidden scene. And by stringing together a series of these recovered one-dimensional images, we can actually recover a one-dimensional movie that indicates the changes in the hidden scene over time. So note that we're able to reconstruct the angular position of the blue and red people as they're kind of walking around. And, and even that you see here that the red person walked in front of the blue person. So in this video, we actually used a bright light to illuminate the clothing of the people so that their colors are, um, clearly show up in the reconstruction. But in um, the other experiments we did, we just used light that was just naturally present in the scene. And so in this example, we, um, there was no, it was just your regular overhead lighting. And, um, but by, by looking at these one-dimensional videos we get out, we can, we, we can learn a lot. So we can figure out not only their angular position, but also the speed and manner of their movement. And additionally, by looking at the number of trajectories, you can see, oh, on the left, there's only one person walking, whereas on the right, there are two. Um, but you might wonder, you know, um, in this last case, um, in the previous case, you could actually clearly see those colors, and here you can't. So the reason why is typically people are kind of wearing clothes that are darker compared to their surroundings. So um, usually uh, the walls around us are white and bright, or we're outside in the sunlight, and this is why um, we kind of ca cause a dark trajectory on the videos that we get. But the addition of a person into the scene actually is a really small change in the pump number. So a person causes uh, about a 0.1% change in the total intensity of the light being reflected. Um, and so that's why the, the, this is usually really uh, quite invisible to the naked eye. It's such a small change. Um, for instance, this is a video that's actually plain. You can't, and I can't really see any changes. And if you think about it, you can only, you know, if you only can see 0.1% of an 8-bit image, that's only uh, a fourth of an intensity level which is like incredibly small. So how can we even recover it? Well, recall that we have these circles along space, so we're going to average, we're averaging information across space, so we're using this two-dimensional image to create a one-dimensional image, and that's how we can reduce the noise down enough that we can um, kind of reliably get out these tracks quite, um, in a lot of situations. So not just in, you know, we've tried many um, less controlled scenarios, um, than the one I showed before where it was a white floor. <laughs> so, um, so for example, here was one that was outside. And, um, and you know, in this case, it was just a brick floor. Uh, there's grass kind of growing out of it. And we can still, though, in this case, um, see the trajectory as, as Vicky is moving around. And so to, to do this, we actually subtract out an average background frame. And we're just looking at deviations over time. So you have to have motion to, to get out this information. Another kind of uh, cool thing is that when I introduced the method, I made the assumption that the floor was this Lambertian surface, it's all diffuse, everything. But actually, it, um, it works quite well in a number of situations, even, even when it, the floor is not <laughs> perfectly diffuse. So for instance, in the indoor, indoor tile floor at the top, um, there was a specular component causing some of the artifacts. But because there's still a large diffuse component, we can still get out tracks a lot of the time. Um, Here's an, uh, an example of one of the ones that we did outside. Um, and the reason I, I, I like to show this one, too, is because we went back to the same location a different day to try to take some additional experiments. And it started raining. 
And we thought, okay, there's like no <laughs> chance that we're going to get useful information out of this. There's huge raindrops showing up on the ground. But because we're looking for this very particular you know, signal in circles around that corner, we could, we could still see the track below, behind a lot of the artifacts, which I think is kind of nice. So um, again, the only equipment that we require is that you just have a standard camera. So you can even use an iPhone camera. Uh, um, so in most of our experiments, we did, a, did use a Sony camera, which did have um, temporal compression and um, image compression too. But despite, these, um, uh, but despite that, we still were able to recover um, the tracks. So here was an example where we showed three different cameras, pointed them at the same corner, and we got the tracks from all of them. And of course, when you have the point gray camera, which is much nicer than the iPhone camera, it does better. But um, even with the iPhone camera, when we didn't control any of the auto exposure or anything, we still were able to get out some of the tracks. And as I mentioned earlier, the ability to see around obstructions can prove valuable in a really wide range of applications. So um, since it can even be used when the camera, here was an example where we put the camera really far away. And so we um, wanted to show that in this case, we could still see um, the motion of the people. And so something like this could be potentially used in the future um, to remotely sense occupants in difficult to access rooms, um, such as that during search and seizure operations. And additionally, the method could also help in, that, in um, detecting oncoming vehicles or, or small children um, when they're moving um, behind a building, you know. Um, so, you know, such a method could be used by a car approaching the corner um, where the girl was otherwise hidden. But you may ask, you know, in these situations, uh, for instance, on the car, how are we supposed to get this to work when the camera is moving? We're looking for these such really tiny changes. But actually, Vicky Yi and, uh, and Felix, Nassar, Felix Nassar actually started working on um, an autonomous uh, wheelchair and, and showed that even if you just rectify just finding um, uh, features to match over time, you can rectify the images and still get out. You know, it's not as good uh, as, as with a static camera, but it might start appearing. Um, you can start to see these tracks. Yeah, this is the trajectory here. Um, so, so, you know, there's, there's still work to be done, but there is potential for even getting it working on moving, on a moving camera. And since the method is really lightweight, it also allows us to process the videos in real time and see what's moving um, uh, around the corner in real time, yeah. So uh, Vicky also put together a really nice live demo that you can download online and run on your own streaming video. And so I wanted to show you a bit, uh, a short demo of that today. Um, so right here in this box, I have um, basically this wooden thing here is just causing there to be a corner. And this video is really hard to see. Uh, well, maybe I don't have the corner. Well, okay, there's a video showing of the of the of the the camera is pointed at the corner. And so as I move, let's see if this works. It's been running for a while, so it might have broken. But you can see as I put the person here that you can see the trajectory moving. So the camera can't see. It, maybe I can I don't show you that the camera can't see that. So here's the view of the camera. I should have recalibrated it, but here's the corner. <laughs> so you can see as I move the person around, you can get a trajectory of the angular position. <coughs> and here I have a snowman who illuminates red so you can see that it's actually, in this case, a red curve. Anyway, you can come play with it later if you're interested. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, by taking um, you know a video of this uh, corner, we can use this really simple algorithm to recover the one-dimensional um, video of the hidden scene. Um, I want to also mention, though, that other things that you can do with this uh, with this information. So, um, as because your angular um, width increases as you get close to the corner, you can use this information a bit to even see uh, the relative position of the person behind that corner. Um, 
um, since it gets thicker and, um, and thinner. But, you know, is there some other, um, you know, information we could also use to get better and uh, better idea of the actual position? Well, when you have a doorway, so you have multiple corners, then the, you, you can act, use these um, multiple corner cameras as kind of like stereo cameras. And by, um, by figuring out their actual, the, the position of the person in each camera, you can triangulate their position. So you can see as Adam is uh, moving around, um, then, then, then this position will, uh, then this angular position will change. Um, and so the, since you have this doorway that consists of wall, two walls, and each wall um, can be thought of as, as this edge camera, we can do this to, to, get, to even triangulate the, um, the position of the person over time. So as Vicky is making a roughly circular uh, um, track around the room, we're using the doorway, the two, two sides of the doorway, to track her, her position. And so it seems my time is up, so I will just skip a little bit through this. And so basically, yeah, just hidden information um, about inv in invisible seeds is all around us. And so we um, you know, can just try to find things naturally occurring in the world to learn, about, to learn about them. And so I also want to encourage you to check out our website and to download the code. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Katie, for the amazing talk and the demos that work really cool. Um, questions, guys? Does anyone have any questions? Oh, so we have uh, one over there and then off down here. Uh, very cool. Thank you very much. One question, how much vibration can you tolerate in the camera? So, because it is basically, you are using the tip of the camera to tolerate right? So let's assume you're standing in three quarters and the camera would like vibrate. Yeah. I think it depends on a number of factors. One is how textured is your surface. If your surface is not very textured, then you can handle larger um, shifts because, uh, yeah. Um, but as I showed um, with the example of the moving camera, you can try to rectify, uh, to align those images and still get something reasonable out. But I do think it has to do a lot with the texture of the surface and how much you need to try to remove from that. Other questions? Uh, so I know that you want to use only a consumer camera to do this, but let's say that you have an uh, event camera, which is yeah. uh, I think it's called a DBS sensor that detects all the changes in the scene. Yeah. Would things drastically improve, considering that I assume that it would be more sensitive to changes and it would get rid of all the ambient signals. Um, I don't know if it would be better, but I think that it could be. You could. Uh try it out and see. <laughs> it might be just as good. Yeah, I, but I'm not, I know a little bit about event cameras, but I don't know like their limitations and how. <laughs> uh, and so, so um, here we're looking, I don't know if that limit that we're looking at is below the event camera, what it would be able to detect, because we're really looking at tiny, tiny signal and, and basically averaging across a lot of space. So if it's very binary, it might not be able to get as good of a signal. Out. That's what we're Screen. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, my, my question is not directly related. Uh, so thanks first for the presentation. My question is, did, did you look at, or anybody you know who looked at, uh, seeing beyond the corner by listening, which is actually a, a skill developed by a blind person? Like, uh, you're saying, thinking about like echoes and, and and everything Echoing to... Or, or somebody moving, or uh, air movement, uh, and, and a blind person actually developed the skills that he knows the height, the gender, and even the, sometimes the color of the clothes, and if that person uh, is uh, one or two or not both. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how he works. I think I've heard of someone who does clicking, like makes a clicking sound, and then th looks at things here's the echoes and reconstructs basically in their mind a scene. I think that has a lot more um, parallels with the other methods that people use for seeing around corners with the time of flight kind of. But yeah, I think that's a, you could also merge it with these kind of approaches to get even better uh, reconstructions. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I have a question. So, um, uh, for the power 
Is the sound? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. It still works, but um, yeah. Um, but the method is definitely depends on um, the light. So you have to have light in the scene uh, <laughs> to block. Uh, and um, and I would say that the hardest thing that we have to deal with is actually the fact of if you get close enough to the corner that you see your shadow behind the corner. Because then that, then that is a completely something that we're not modeling in this very simple situation. So actually being able to visually see your shadow hurts uh, our method. Um, so actually having the scene behind the camera makes that less happen less often. And, and yeah, um, but yeah, it, it does depend somewhat on the lighting. So one last question over here. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah. So we did um, some simulations of that, um, not with something like that round, <laughs> but but if you um, if you have a, a slightly rounded corner and you assume that it's um, sharp, you'll get a little bit of artifacts, but it's not um, it's. It's very tolerable, I guess. It actually, it might a little bit shift the absolute position you, you think of where the person is based upon where you think the sharp corner is. <laughs> uh, because you're going to be hitting, because that person's light is going to hit a different part of that curved corner. So it will, it will change the absolute position you recover, but you'll still see this trajectory. All right, so uh, before we ta thank uh, Katie and also the rest of the speakers, you know, session one is over. Now we have a coffee break up there. Um, and at 11, we have our first keynote. So please go to the coffee break and, and come back for the keynote. So let's thank all our speakers. Today.